Seven years ago, my average electricity bill has been 25 to 30 ringgit per month. Whoa. It's not easy because we have designed buildings, unfortunately, not in a very human friendly manner. Think about the Kampung people in Malaysia. Did they need aircon? No. When they came home at night, their house was cool, right? They had trees to provide shade during the day. They didn't have concrete walls that absorbed the heat during the day and released it in the night when they came home. They had stilts, natural roof, and as well the bamboo stuff on the side or the leaves on the side. Now we come home in the evening, it's cold outside. Once we step in, sweatshop, hot. We have made everything out of concrete that absorbs the heat during the day and releases it in the night. So the Kampung people had a much more eco-efficient life. But in our modern way of doing things, we have shifted away from that. So, but the good news is, just two weeks ago, I lived in a, a high-rise condo for a weekend that was designed with those concepts in mind. They actually designed the building, and the surprise is, it's, it was in Sungai Petani. Nobody would expect an eco-friendly building there, but they made a high-rise building certified to an American green building standard. Wind can move through, plus they built the house in such a way that you never have the sun shining in to heat up your house or your walls, but at the same time, the funnel in the middle provides the light. I didn't need any artificial lights during the day. Here we're in an enclosed room, we need to have the lights on, even though there's lots of light out there. Mother Nature provides the light. So the house was designed with optimization of wind movement, shading, passive cooling. I was there, I didn't even need the fan. Some of the ladies would have felt, oh, where's my blanket? It was really cool in the evening because there is a vortex, a wind vortex. They designed the building to maximize the power of the wind to cool the place down. So these things are possible, these things are happening. If you live in a building like that, you don't really need to spend any money on air conditioning. And the biggest part of our electricity bill in Malaysia is air conditioning. So, there are opportunities everywhere. And my main uh, belief is, because of my green lifestyle, which sometimes means I don't buy the things that I don't really need, I have more cash flow in my pocket. The other thing is, I don't have a car. That means another 500 to 1,000 ringgit each month in my pocket that most of you are paying to pay off your car loan. I am not saying we can all live without a car. Maybe if I would be a lady, I would not feel comfortable without a car for safety reasons. Or if I would live somewhere on the outskirts of KL, maybe as well. But I've always chosen a place very central next to public transport. LRT, very good, very efficient. Commuter, not so good. <laughs> not so good. That's why I wouldn't choose a, a place next to the commuter train, because that one ain't reliable. But the LRT, every couple of minutes, you know, it's moving. So I even choose where I live based on that. The other thing is indoor air quality. When I came to Malaysia, I was suspicious about the indoor air quality in Times Square. I have read the other day an article, one of the most famous buildings in Malaysia has a very high concentration of pollutants. And they did a survey compared to an eco-friendly office in Bangi, over 60% of the people working in that office, maybe I shouldn't mention the name of that office, had evidence of sick building syndrome during the period when they were analyzing. If you think about that from a corporate perspective, it's gonna cost you a lot of money if your employees are off work. But even from a social perspective, we don't want to have our employees suffer health issues. I've been at construction sites in Malaysia, you have bottles of building materials there, no name on it, you don't know what's in there, the only thing that you can see is a death skull symbol. You go to shopping malls, refurbishment, Yet yesterday, Tuesday, right? I was at BFM 89.9, the office of the radio. Every Tuesday at one o'clock, 
for the next six weeks, I'm being interviewed on how to make business green, how to benefit from that, and so on. So you can listen in on that. But I came in there, I said straight away, you've done some refurbishment here. They use toxic solvents. You know the glue smell? Mm -hmm. And they had several pregnant women there. Dangerous. They said, yeah, actually, we used eco-friendly paint, but then they varnished the doors. And for the varnishing, they used the toxic solvent. So the whole place was smelling toxic. And it takes quite a long time to get rid of that. And then people suffer from it because you're inhaling solvents, formaldehyde, and all that kind of stuff. So going green in our personal lives can save us money and can help us improve our health, particularly if you have young children. At the moment, the problem is not many people are asking for those kind of things when they are buying something because maybe the awareness is not there. But that one, I think, will change as we go along. The problem is the cost that the Malaysian taxpayer pays to support a health system that treats diseases that might come from pollution. Who knows about that? There's a lot of hidden environmental cost that you are paying through your taxpayer's contribution. The latest thing that I came across, not sure whether you've heard of that, they are building a water pipe from Pahang to Selangor to supply fresh water to Selangor, our area where we live. Anyone an idea how much that water pipe is going to cost? Any guesses? It was budgeted at 3.9 billion ringgit. The latest estimate is 8 plus something billion ringgit. I asked Keta, who is responsible for that, who is going to pay for it. Oh, yeah, uh, I guess, you know, the government has to pay for it. So where does the government get its money from? I think if you would have invested a fraction of that money into rainwater harvesting, water efficiency, we could have avoided such an expensive construction process that's going to cost everyone in Malaysia 8 billion, 23 million, calculate how much all of us have to contribute to financing such a project. And what about the operational costs? So the cash flow that we can generate from going green, I'll give you some examples as well from businesses, but I want to just open up with, with a very wide perspective on this. Because there is money everywhere, but we might not see it. Some of that might be indirectly to the cost to the country that ultimately the taxpayer has to pay. I think the budget that has been allocated to clean up the Klang River apparently is 15 billion ringgit. The Klang River is smelly, dirty. You can't have a romantic restaurant on the Klang River like both the Clarkton, right? Think about 15 million cleanup cost. Think about the loss of revenue from real estate that's not worth anything, even though it's next to a river. If that real estate would be as nice as Boat Key, Clark Key, you would fetch in premium prices. Now, nobody wants to rent the site that's on the Klang River because it's too dirty, it's too smelly. So even loss of revenue through environmental degradation can be huge. The tree standing tall Cameroon Highland, holding the soil together, turning carbon dioxide into oxygen, cleaning up the water so we have clean water downstream, avoiding erosion, avoiding landslide that might kill people, has no value in terms of economic growth. The problem sometimes is only when we chop down the tree and sell it, we are contributing to the economic growth. So the way we measure things is sometimes already tricky from an environmental perspective. So if we can look at it more holistically in the long term, we will all benefit from it. 